Welcome back to our class. This is going to be lecture number nine, part one. And let's return to our scripture and what we have been talking about, which is specifically tells us in Exodus chapter 20. Let's look at verse four, five, and six. You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth or beneath or in the water upon the earth or under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers. He says, on the children, on the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, we have had a long conversation with regard to in our last class about the reasons why. And I just want to continue with that, but I want you to show this, because God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The scriptures emphatically state this. It cannot get any more clearer than this, ladies and gentlemen. My dear brethren, to my saints and to the beloved saints, and I want you to understand this, and to those who are hearing my voice, at whatever distance that you hear yourself, you need to comprehend what the scriptures actually says. In John chapter 4, we are told the reason why we cannot violate the second commandment that you shall, not, you shall not have any idols or any likeness or any images. You cannot make them. Look what he says in John 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Listen to this. He says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now, I just want to focus briefly on something here because I need you to see this with me. In John 4, 24, there's a little word there. It's, it's the word must, M-U-S-T, must. And now I want you to understand what that word is. That word in the Greek language, in the original language in which the New Testament was written in, is the word day, day. Not is in, not is in, not, not is in the days of the week or the work day, but day, D-E-I, not D-A-Y, but D-E-I. And that word means non-negotiable obligatory requirement. Non-negotiable obligatory requirement. This is, so when he says those, God is spirit and those who worship him are must, they are obliged to. They're under an obligatory requirement. This is non-negotiable. Worship him in spirit and truth, not with images. And you need to comprehend that. Why? Because God is spirit. Now, in the King James Version, in John 4, 24, it says God is a spirit. That's it. There's an indefinite article there when it says God is a spirit. That's the indefinite article. But in the original language, that doesn't exist. It says God is is spirit, period. Now, let me take you to a second of scripture that perhaps is very difficult to comprehend, but you need to see this with me. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, please, and go there to verse 20 to 25. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 to 25. I need you to see this with me. Because Paul is speaking about the wrath of God that would befall upon man. Why? Because man has violated this great second commandment. And this is what Paul addresses here in Romans chapter 1. Go back with me to verse 20. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. And let's just walk through these verses verse by verse. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, talking about God, his eternal power, talking about God, his divine nature, talking about God, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without what? Excuse. Who? Who's without excuse? Man. Man is without excuse. Look at verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not Honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile, futile in their speculations and foolish heart was darkened. In verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. That unfortunately is the state of many individuals who profess, who profess to be believers in the church have become fools. And, and now look why. He explains why in verse 23. 
and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God, the invisible God, the God that cannot be seen. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That is the condition of man. That's the reason why we're told in verse 22, they became fools. Now look at verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And then look at verse 25. Why? Because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, if you, once again, we see in the New Testament, turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, and this is what it says. And, and, and the Apostle John writes it this way, Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Guard yourselves from idols. Be careful. Guard yourself. In Leviticus, let's go back to the Old Testament. Look at what he says in Leviticus chapter 26, Verse 1. Go back to the Old Testament, please. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 1. You shall not make for yourselves idols, nor shall you set up for yourselves an image or a sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figured stone in your land to bow to it, he says, for I am the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, look at verses 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. 15 to 19 says this. So watch yourselves carefully, in verse 15, since you did not see any form on the day of the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire. So God appears to them in the midst of the fire, and they did not see a physical form. So that you do not act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure and the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, and the likeness of any fish that is in the water below the earth. And beware, look at verse 19, and beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the people under the whole heaven. Again in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16, beware that your hearts are not deceived and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. You see the importance of what we're addressing here in the second commandment? Thirdly, this commandment prohibits covetousness. Covetousness. It prohibits craving after and seeking anything more than one craves and, and seeks after God himself. Again, we turn to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, and you see, you shall not worship them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, and I am what? A jealous God. I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children on the third and the fourth generation of, he says, of what? He says, of those who hate me. We are told that, that idolatry is covetousness. In the book of Colossians in the New Testament, this is what it says in chapter 3 and in verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to what? Dead to immorality, dead to impurity, dead to passion, dead to evil desire, and greed, which amounts to what? Idolatry. Immorality, impurity, passion, evil, evil desire, and greed all amounts to idolatry. Scripture emphatically declares in Colossians 3, 5 that covetousness is idolatry. Why are we talking about this? Because covetousness is craving and desiring something so much that a person makes it the primary thing in his life. And I know for a fact that the majority, the overwhelming majority of those who are listening to me right now, wherever you find yourselves in the airwaves, on the internet, wherever it is that you find yourselves, this is the problem that you and I face. 
The object tends to become the first thing in the person's life, the major craving, the longing desire of the person's heart and life. That's what covetousness is. It's craving and desiring something so much that the person makes it the primary thing in their life. See, let, let, me, let me give you some examples here for you. A person can covet and make an idol out of absolutely anything. Let me give you a list of them. Anything, and I believe it'll cover just about the whole gamut from A to Z, and including those that I've not thought of at the moment. Look, you can, you, a person can come in and make an idol out of anything. Listen to me. Out of sex, drugs, alcohol, family, money, fame, power, pornography, ritual, ceremony, girlfriend, boyfriend, recreation, sports, business, position, job, country, crucifix, or cross. That pretty much covers it all. See, a person's God or idol is that which he puts first in his life, that which he desires and craves the most, that to which he gives his life, his primary, his primary thoughts, his energy, his primary energy, his time, and money. It, it's all completely devoted to that one thing. Note what God said about a man during the last days of human history. You know, God is very, very, very clear. He's very clear. So I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let me show you this. In 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's look at this together. Because I think you really need to see this. So you get a better comprehension of what I am attempting to address here. Look at this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now let's go through. Let's look at the first five verses. And kind of put this in its proper context. Look what he says. In, in verse 1 he says. But realize this. That in the last days difficult times will come. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> for men will be lovers of what? Of self. Lovers of what? Of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unlo unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Now, I want you to see what God said about man during the last days of human history. A, they will be lovers of self. That's clearly what we're told here in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. You see that? And then number B, they will be lovers of pleasure. Lovers of pleasure. We see this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4. Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then number, number C, their, their God will be their own stomachs. Their own stomachs. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Man, there are people who just died to eat. They're just dying to eat. That's all they can consider. That's the only thing they can think of. Mm -hmm. That's why gluttony is a sin. Look what he says in Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 19 with me. He says this. From, and let's start in verse 18. Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 18. For, me, for, many walk of whom, for many walk of whom I often told you. And now I'll tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their what? Their appetite. Whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. They're like the Epicureans, the old, great, the old Greek philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry, tomorrow we die. Now I want you to listen to a great man who wrote who wrote on this subject, and let's, let's just quote him, because I want you to see it, because he has a very practical comment on this commandment, the second commandment, that you should have no idols and make only images, okay? That is well worth quoting at length here. And it is a good, it is a good quote, and I need you to listen to it very, very carefully, because uh, I, I, I think it, it, it's worth, well worth the time. His name is Maxine Dunn. Maxine Dunn says this, 
God is unseen, a spirit and power invisible to our eyes. So we need settings, symbols, places of worship to be vivid reminders of God. The problem comes when the symbol, the reminder, becomes a substitute, when it becomes an idol and takes the place of God. There's a dramatic story of this in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. In their wandering through the wilderness, the people of Israel were attacked and tortured by fiery serpents. Moses, on the instruction of God, made a bronze serpent and set it up on a pole. Those who have been bitten looked at the bronze serpent and were healed. Not much is made of that story as it is found in the book of Numbers chapter 21. So I want to ask you to just go there briefly with me in Numbers chapter 21 because I want you to see this in the first, in verse 6, 8, 9. Verse 6, 7, 8, 9, chapter 21. Look what it says. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people became, came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said, it said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, note this. But centuries later, we find that the bronze serpent making another brief appearance in the scriptures. This time we find King Hezekiah breaking the serpent in pieces because the people have been burning incense to it. And we see this in 2 Kings chapter 18. In 2 Kings chapter 18, turn your Bibles there with me and look at verse 4. In 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, it says, He removed, well actually let's start in verse 1. Now it came about in the third year of Hosea, of Hosea, the, the, of Hosea, the son of, Eli, uh, of Ella, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Now look at verse 4. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Azahara, and he also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the son of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehashutan. Now I need you to see this with me. Okay. This is exactly what happens. This time, the king Hezekiah breaking the serpent in pieces because the people had been burning incense to him. What had happened? What Moses had used as a reminder of God's power, prevailing over the poison of the serpents bit by bit and had become a god itself. That's the problem with idols. This has, happened to the, this has happened in Christian history in relation to the cross and the crucifix. That which is to be a reminder of the love of the cross meant to help men and women in looking at it, fix their hearts and their minds on the one who bled and died there, becomes regarded with superstitious reverence. The cross or the crucifix becomes a holy thing now. <coughs> Excuse me. The symbol is identified and confused with the reality for which it stands. The core lesson is this, whenever anyone or anything usurps the place that God should have in our lives, we are guilty of idolatry, period. For most of us, that would, not be, that would not be a graven image such as a cross or a crucifix. But how easily money becomes an idol, we allow money and how we get it and how we use it to edge God out of the number one place in our lives. That's the reason why I'm always talking about people that the number one excuse why they cannot love and serve God is their job. I've seen love in marriage distorted to the point that it usurps God's place in our lives. I've certainly seen love of country distorted to the point that it blinds people to God's call to justice and righteousness. The making of idols usually makes, means making the means an end. This happens all the time in the church. I know some people who do that with the Bible. The Bible itself becomes an idol. Listen carefully to the people who passionately crusade in their words to save the Bible. Look at their lives. We can angrily wage a war to protect the inerrancy of the Bible and appear to be righteous in the cause and still lose our souls. 
That's the problem Jesus was addressing when he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter what? The kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my heavenly Father. In all sorts of ways, we have committed the sin of idolatry by making the means an end. Even in our worship, we turn the liturgy, our means of worshiping God, into an end itself. So that the means and the methods of worship become what? They become more important than the worship itself. We need to even look at our spiritual disciplines. Spiritual discipline is for the purpose of facilitating what? Our relationship to God. We pray and worship and study scriptures. Sometimes we fast to be open to God, to cultivate Christ's presence. But to make these disciplines ends in themselves, to make the measurement of how, these, of how holy we are, is making a discipline a fetish. Not only are we in danger of turning others off, when we zealously exaggerate these disciplines, these, these disciplines, but they become idols in our lives. Let me also quote to you, J. Vernon McGee also has an excellent application on this commandment. This is what he says. Some people may feel that this passage does not apply to us today. But Colossians 3.5 tells us that covetousness is idolatry. Anything that you give yourself, especially in abandonment, becomes your God. Now, many people do not worship Bacchus, a cloven-footed Greek-Roman god of wine and revelry of long ago, but they worship the bottle just the same. There are millions of alcoholics in our country right now. The liquor interests, the liquor interests like to tell us how, about how much of the tax burden they carry, when actually they do not pay a, a fraction of the bill for the casualties that they cause by their product. A, a lot of propaganda is being fed to this generation and large groups of people are being brainwashed. Whether or not folk recognize it, they worship the god of Bacchus. Other people worship Aphrodite, that is the goddess of sex. Some people worship money, anything to which we give, anything that, anything that you give, anything that which you give your time, your heart and your soul becomes your God. And God says that we are not to have any other gods before him. Note what he says in Psalm chapter 115. And let's look at verses 2 to 8. Psalm 115 verses 2 to 8 says, Why should the nation say, Where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold and the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot, see, they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become what? Like them. Everyone who trusts in them. Ladies and gentlemen, we are prohibited from making images and likenesses and idols and bowing our knees to them. Welcome back to our class, and once again, we're looking at the second commandment of the Ten Commandments that is found in the book of Exodus chapter 20. We're going to looking at four, point number four today, and that is, why did God give this commandment? Number four, why did God give this commandment? And let's focus in on verse five and six, Exodus chapter 20, verse five and six. You shall have no other, you shall make no other idols or images or liken unto him. Look what he says. In verse 5 and 6, you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am, he says, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children on the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, I want you to comprehend a number of issues here, and that is that God gave this commandment for at least 
three reasons, minimum at least three reasons, okay? Number one, first God prohibits the worship of idols. Why? Because he's a jealous God. That's why. Now the Hebrew word for jealous means to be red in the face. Red in the face. God loves and cares for man. God does not want people living in error and following false gods that can do absolutely nothing to help them throughout life. Therefore, God is jealous, hot in the face against anything that turns people away from the truth and from God himself. I want you to note this fact. Scripture declares that idolatry is spiritual adultery. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. Therefore, the displeasure of God against idolatry is rightly called jealous. That's why jealousy means that God has a sensitive nature, a nature of love. God is a jealous of anything or anyone who threatens to take away the honor, the recognition, or the reverence that is due to him and him alone. So therefore, if a person gives his primary devotion, his primary attention, his primary honor, his primary time, his primary primary energy, his primary effort, or his money to anything other than God himself, he commits spiritual adultery against God. He turns away from God to something else. And look at the results. God becomes jealous, red hot against any person who is unfaithful to him. Man must never forget God does not tolerate unfaithfulness. He will never allow a rival to replace him. And that's one of the biggest problems that we face in the church today. The adultery, the level of adultery that is allowed to take place and it is not dealt with openly in the church body with church discipline has allowed us to now also commit spiritual adultery with the living God. So I have a number of points that I want to share with you with regard to this specifically and quite a number of scripture that we're going to be driving you to this in this session. So I want you to know what scripture says. Point A, God's jealousy will not allow his glory and honor to ever be transferred to another. That's not going to happen. Look, in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8, this is what he says. I am the Lord and he says that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. In Isaiah 48, 1, he says, Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are named Israel, and who came forth from the loins of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth nor in righteousness. Point B, God declares that his very name, his very name is Jealous. Therefore, he absolutely will not tolerate the worship of any other of any God, of any other God. Look what he says in Exodus chapter 34, verses 13 and 14. But rather you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their asherim, for you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is what? Is jealous, is a jealous God. Point C, God's jealousy arouses his anger against those who deny and hate him. In Deuteronomy 6.15, he says this, For the Lord your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you off the face of the earth. You know, it's amazing to me that we talk about the love of God all the time, but we never ever seem to want to discuss the wrath of God. Point D, God's jealousy will judge those who oppose him. Again, in Deuteronomy chapter 29, Deuteronomy chapter 29, look what he says in verse 20. The Lord shall never be willing to forgive him, but rather, look what he says, the Lord shall never be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man, and every curse which is written in this book will rest on him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under the heavens. It's as absolutely incredible when you see this. Now, I have a number of scriptures. I just want to show you this because, you know, we, we, we're, we're so enamored with the idea and the concept only of that God is love. God is love. God is love. And you hear all these people talking about, if God is love, how can he allow this? How can he allow that? It's because they're speaking to their own ignorance of the scriptures of Holy Scripture. They have not said, they have not seen what God actually says. God is both love. But he's also a righteous God and a God of wrath. Now look what he says in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 22. 
Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to what? To jealousy more than all that their fathers had done with the sins which they committed. In Psalm chapter 79, verse 5, Psalm 79, 5 says, How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your, je will, will your jealousy burn like fire? Isaiah 42, 13 says, The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against all his enemies. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17 says this, He put on the righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with a zeal as a mantle. And Ezekiel chapter 5 verse 13 says this, Thus my anger will be spent and I will satisfy my wrath on them. And I will be appeased. Then they will know that I the Lord have spoken in my zeal when I have spent my wrath upon them. Can you imagine? He says, and when I have spent my wrath upon them. I cannot even imagine, I can't even fathom what that looks like. In Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 38, thus I will judge you like a woman who commit adultery or shed blood or judged uh, uh, or shed blood are judged and I will bring on you the blood of wrath and jealousy. Ezekiel chapter 23 verse 25, I will set my jealousy against you that they may deal with you in wrath. They will remove your nose and your ears and your survivors will fall by the sword and they will take your sons and daughters and your survivors will be consumed by the fire. Ezekiel 36, 5. Therefore thus says the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all of Edom and who appropriated my land for themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and with the scorn of a soul, of a soul to drive it out for a prey. And Nahum, the book of Nahum chapter 1 verse 2 he says, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves the wrath for his what? For his enemies. And Zephaniah chapter 1 in verse 18, neither their silver nor their gold, he says, will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's what? Wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of what? Of his jealousy. For he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. Look what he says also in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord. For the day when I rise up as a witness, indeed my decision to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, and all my burning anger for all the earth will be devoured by fire of my zeal. And then look what he says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 7 and 8. He who overcome will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But... Look what he says. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the immoral persons and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the, t in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let's look at point E. God's jealousy, his zeal will vindicate his true people, his true followers. He tells us in 2 Corinthians, Kings chapter 19 verse 31 for out of the Jerusalem will go forth the remnant of my Mount Zion survivors the zeal of the Lord will perform this and Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 he tells us there will be and no there will be no end to the increase of his government and of the oil of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 11, he says, O Lord, your hand is lifted up, yet they do not see. They see your zeal for the people and are put to shame. Indeed, fire will devour your enemies. 
In Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 25 says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel. And he says, And I will be jealous for my holy name. In Joel chapter 2, verse 18, And then the Lord will be zealous for his land and will have pity on his people. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 14, he says, So the angel who was speaking with me said to me, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. In Zechariah 8, 2, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath I am jealous for her. Point F, God's jealousy demands total what? Allegiance, loyalty, and devotion. God demands total allegiance, loyalty, and devotion. In the book of Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, the Lord says, For you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Look with me in Joshua chapter 24, verse 19. Then Joshua said to the people, You will not be able to serve the Lord, for he is what? A holy God. He is what? A jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression or your sins. Listen to me. And now we go into our second main reason. Second, God prohibits the worship of idols because the influence of idolatry passed down from the parents to their children. If a person's worship is false, he leads his children and his grandchildren into false worship. What he does greatly influences and affects his family. We must never forget this one fact. The human race is a living organism. What one person does affects other persons. This is clearly seen in the acts of love and care and benevolence, war, lawlessness, drunkenness, drugs, immorality. In all the acts of behavior, the closer a person is to others, the more the person's actions affect them. People's influence people, and the point of this verse is that parents influence children, greatly influence them. A mother who is a drug addict is likely to lead her children to use drugs. A father who's, who loves and puts sports before God leads the children to love and put things before God. That's the reason why he tells us here in Exodus chapter 20, and look what he says in verse 6. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Why? Because look at verse 5. You shall not work Worship them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. This is the impact that you have on your children and your grandchildren. Now note that the scripture uses the word hate here in verse, 20, in verse 5 in Exodus chapter 20. If parents deny and hate God and worship idols, the children will be greatly influenced to deny and hate God and worship idols as well. Consequently, God's judgment falls upon the children for generations. The result and the consequences of idolatry are, horror, are utterly terrible. The worship of idols, just like all other influence, all other behavior, influences the children of a family. Children are conditioned, heavily influenced by the behavior of their parents and their surroundings. Therefore, if a parent worships idols, most likely the children will, in fact, worship idols. And all idolaters shall be judged by God. Therefore, the sin of idolatry and the judgment upon idolatry are passed down from generation to generation terrible consequences all due to the sins of the fathers and the mothers especially the evil sin of idolatry this idea this notion that when my child grows up I'm allow him to choose if he wants to love and serve God that's ludicrous you are already influencing him to hate God this is what is known as the as the as the judicial judgment of God God let me tell you something a judgment that is justly deserved if a parent sows the seed of idolatry, he's usually going to bear children who will be greatly influenced by his behavior. The children would deny and hate God and worship the idols of man. But I want you to note this. This does not mean that God holds a child guilty for the sins of his parents because he does not. God is not talking about the guilt of sin. He's talking about the results, the consequences of sin. Every
every person shall bear the judgment and punishment of his own sin. No person will ever be judged and punished for the sins of others. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 16 says this. Look what he says. He says, fathers shall not put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. Now I want you to think about this thought for a moment with me. God punishes sin, period. The sins of all people for all generations. God executes justice. Justice upon the sins of the fathers and the sins of the children. No generation of sin ever escapes the judgment of God. Do not be deceived. Do not be fooled into thinking that he does. Remember the book of Acts in chapter 17? Remember what it says in verse 30 and 31? Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should what? What it is that they should do? They should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Who is that? Jesus Christ. You remember 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1 in verse 7 and 9 says the following. And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power." In Jude, in the book of Jude, look what he says in verse 14 and 15. He tells us, it was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute what? Judgment upon all and to convict what? All the ungodly of all the ungodly deeds which they have done in ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You think anybody's going to escape this? I doubt it. Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah 65 tells us in verse 6 and 7. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay, and I will even repay into their bosom, both their own iniquities and the iniquities of their fathers together, says the Lord, because, because they have burned incense on the mountains and scorned me on the hills, therefore I will measure their former work into their bosom. The crying prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 16 verses 11 through 13 says this, Then you are to say to them, It is because your forefathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord, and have followed other gods and served them and bowed down to them, but me they have forsaken and have not kept my law. You too have done evil, even more than your fathers. For behold, you are each one walking according to what? To the stubbornness of his own evil heart without listening to me. That's why you will be judged. So I will hurt, I will hurl you out of this land into the land which you have not known. Neither you or nor your fathers. There and there you will serve other gods day and night. For I will grant you no favor. In Jeremiah 17 10 he says I the Lord search the heart I test the mind even to give to each man according to his ways according to the results of his deeds. In the book of Ezekiel in chapter 18 we are told the following in verse 4 he says behold all souls he says all souls are mine the soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine and he says the soul who the soul who sins will die and here's the third reason God prohibits the worship of idols because the influence of a loving and obedient parent lasts forever for a thousand generations. Note that the sin and the punishment of idolatry is passed down from three or four generations, but the love and obedience of parents is passed down to the children for thousands of generations. This is what is known in Hebrew uh, in, 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 in Hebrew as in, is known as Hebrew parallelism. It does not mean thousands of people, but thousands of 
generations. Note exactly what the verse says. God's mercy is shown to thousands of those who love and obey him, shown for thousands of generations. That's what he is saying here, here in, his, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 6, but showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Parents who love God and keep God's commandments, okay, uh, two things are true about it. Will Number one, will influence their children for thousands of generations. And two, will have mercy of God showered upon thousands of their children for thousands of generations. This shows the awesome influence of parents upon children and the absolute necessity of loving and obeying God. Judgment will fall upon those who disobey this commandment, fall upon the parents and their children for three or four generations. But God's mercy will be showered upon those who obey this commandment, be showered upon thousands of children for thousands of generations. However, note a most significant fact here. God's mercy is showered only upon upon the obedient, only upon those who love and keep his commandments, the very commandments he is spelling out in this passage. And, and so I want you to note this, that's the reason why he tells us in, in Exodus 24, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in the heaven or above on the earth, beneath or in the water upon the earth. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, this is the second commandment. You remember 2 Chronicles 17, 3 says this, the Lord... Uzziah was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of their father David's earlier days and did not seek the Baals. Second Chronicles 26, 4 says, He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. In Proverbs 22, 6, we are told, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. In 2 Timothy 1, 5, For I am mindful of the, of the sincere faith within you, Timothy, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is well, it is well within you.